Hi, my name is Nicola. I work as a software engineer for JP Morgan, where I do quite a bit of Scala. And I'm here today because I would like to talk to you about monads and stuff. <laughs> now, it's not obvious from the title, but that is the point of the talk. Now, the reason I want to talk to you about that is, well, anybody who's anybody in the functional programming community has spoken or talked about these things. And I haven't, and I'd dearly like to be somebody who's somebody, so here we are. Now, that does justify me wanting to talk about these things, but not necessarily where you should listen to them, right? So, the reason you should re listen to me is because, well, first, we're well, going to get the basic, aren't you? You're going to get the reasons why you should be using these abstractions, how they work, when to use them, when not to use them. Uh, but that's really the bare minimum you should be expecting from such a talk, right? Is if you don't get at least that, it's not really worth attending. So what I'm going to do on top of that is give you a software design technique that, if you don't really know it, might actually change the way you write software forever. And, and I know that's a pretty bold statement, but A, I believe I might actually live up to it, and, and B, you kind of have to stay until the end now to make sure that I'm actually delivering on it, don't you? So that's actually my sales pitch. <coughs> and now that that's done, the, um, like most of my talks, what I'm going to be doing is use some of my real-life experience to justify the rest of the scenario I'm going to go through. And in this scenario, the inciting incident was me trying to buy a PlayStation 5. Now, you might not care about games all that much or be interested in PlayStation 5. You can replace that with whatever you want, provided it's available online and really hard to get your hands on. So you could say a, um, um, sorry, a collector edition of a piece of your favorite artist, a ticket to a cool concert, uh, an action figure from Uncle Bob for your personal shrine, whatever works for you, uh, provided it's hard to find online. And in my case, it was a PS5, which was really hard to buy. So hard that in the end, it started to feel reasonable for me to um, write some software to do it for me. Write a clever little crawler that would aggregate information from various online marketplaces and uh, run through some heuristics. And when some hit was found, send me an email so that I could purchase, purchase it. And that would have been a very reasonable solution for a software engineer. But back when that happened, I was not a software engineer, I was a CTO, so I used a reasonable CTO solution to the problem. I recruited an intern and had them reload online marketplaces all day long, which sorted the problem I'm at real quick. But that would make for a very boring presentation, wouldn't it? So we're going to place ourselves in an alternate timeline in which I did a slightly darker timeline, really, in which I did the wrong thing and um, automated a job away from a poor intern. Now, had I done that, the heart of my platform would have been, and of course, that's not working. There we go. Would have been the item, where an item is whatever it is that you can buy. So it's defined by its identifier, its name, its price, and the identifier of its seller. And um, so that would be the heart of your platform. But depending on where you find yourself in the platform, you might not have an item, but say an option of item. Because um, you might be looking up the item in the database and there might not be any match for your identifier. Or you might find a future of item because it might take a while for you to actually get the item in the long term. Or a try of item because it might fail. Or an either of item, which is just a pretentious try. Or any other context that you might find uh, or combination of this context. And the point of this talk is to show you how you can work against item, but reuse this function in any of these contexts. And the first thing we're going to do is to check for items that are affordable, because I'm trying to buy a PlayStation 5, but not at any cost. So how would you write that? The basic implementation is fairly simple, affordable, which, given an item, checks whether the price is affordable and returns that. That's pretty trivial. And that gives us the heart of this diagram, right? But we want to get every single piece of the diagram. So we're going to go through a few of those by hand just to show that it can be done, but it should not be done. Uh, the first one is going to be option. So we're going to write affordable option, which is basically affordable, except everything is wrapped in an option. And the way you do that is through a lot of boilerplate and eventually called affordable. So that gives us option and uh, the original item. Let's do try. Try, affordable try, is basically the same pattern. Um, you wrap everything in a try, 
lots of bullet plate, and then you um, call the foldable. And that gives us the first half of that diagram, but not the second one. And I'm not too worried about future or either, because it's going to be a pain, it's going to be annoying to write them, but we're going to get around to that, right? But that ellipsis at the bottom right, it's unbounded. There's an unlimited amount of functions that we might have to write just to be able to use affordable in any context. And that is just not reasonable. What we want to do is to be able to write one specific function that handles every other case. What we want to do is write a function that I called here affordable f. Word on naming, um, that f bit comes the, from the f-type constructor, which is a name that I absolutely hate, but it is an, an idiom that we have landed on in the Scala community because whenever we see a type constructor, cannot be for anything but modeling effects, can it? can it not? It's got to be that. So we're always going to call them f because this is how you spell effect with an F and an X, like a bad DJ from the 90s. So I absolutely hate that name, but it's our convention. I'm going to keep using that for the other presentation. And so we're going to do the same thing we did for, for, for option and for try. We're going to wrap everything in an F. But then how do we go about implementing that? Well, there's really nothing we can do, is there? Because we don't know anything about F. It's just... We know it's a type, but we don't know what it is. It's, it could be anything, and the uh, lowest de common denominator of everything is nothing, so we know nothing about it. So we're kind of stuck, and when stuck, something that works quite well is to draw. So here's a drawing. That's our input. We have an f of item, and our desired output is an f of Boolean. And all we have to do, all we have, the, tool, the only tools we have to go from one to the other is this function affordable. And the point, the goal of the exercise here is to somehow go from the input to the desired output, and clearly that's not going to happen here because we don't have a path from one to the other. But we could have a path, right? What we wish we could do is take that affordable function here and somehow move it up, lift it, as it were, so that we get this function, affordable.lift, which goes from our input to our desired output. Um, <clears throat> we don't have that function, but we could wish for it. We could, we could pretend that somebody else has solved the problem and use that result, right? We could make it somebody else's problem. And that, while it's a design technique more closely associated with management, usually, it's actually quite efficient for development. We make it somebody else's problem, but it does, we still have a little bit of work to do we still have to give that whoever that is the tool they need to provide us with their answer, which is traditionally in Scala encoded as a type class, like Julien presented just before. Now, that type class here would be called lift, because we've seen that we want to lift something up in a diagram, right? And we've seen that the goal of that, the, um, <coughs> the behavior that we want to expose would be go from a function from A to B to a function from f of a to f of b. We don't know how to implement that. We don't care. It's not our problem. We're just going to say, you need to do that. And if you've done that, what I can do is this diagram. I can make it commute. I now have a complete path from f of item to f of boolean, and that is the solution to my problem. And now that we have the solution, we can just follow the arrows in order to implement the solution. So affordable f is, well, we've seen the first step is just follow affordable.lift. So let's do that. And now that we have a function, we apply, and sorry, in order for that to work, we need f to be a lift. And then we can just apply that to our f item, and we have a solution. Now, that bit of code here, I don't know about you, makes me a little bit un uncomfortable. It's, 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 not, it's not very pretty. It's not the way we used to write in code, isn't it? Now, if you feel that way as well, I can explain why it makes you feel uncomfortable, but you're not going to like it. The problem with that is this is very functional. And for all we like to think of ourselves as um, fancy functional programmers, we don't like that, this context of what we have is a function, and we transform that function, we lift it, and then we apply it to some input, which is the essence of functional programming, isn't it? Now, what we like is that. That makes a lot more sense to us, it's a lot more comfortable, isn't it? And that is object programming, because we have an object and we apply a method. We are all object-oriented programmers. Very sorry about that. Um, right, so map is really very much just a different perspective on lift. We could implement one in terms of the other. Map is simply a call to lift. 
right? They're just, and you could, of course, implement Lyft in terms of map. You can implement one in terms of the other and vice versa. So they're just different perspective on exactly the same feature. Right, and now that we have map and that we have comfortable code, we're going to have to name the thing, because this is obviously not called Lyft. That would be too easy, wouldn't it? Um, the actual name that we use for that is Functure. There are categorical reasons for why it's called that way. I'm not going to explain them. The first reason why I'm not going to is it's not really very relevant to my point, so I'm not going to bother. And the second one is I really couldn't, I don't understand it. But this is called a functor. And um, I think that's all I have to say about functors. What have we learned so far? We've learned that you use a functor when you have to work with one value within some f. You, the primary operation of a functor is lift or equivalently map. Right, so that was the first step of the presentation where we were able to filter out all the data that we found on our online marketplaces to only find the one we could afford. But now that's, that's definitely going to yield at some point two different items, different prices, but both, that we want, both the items that we want to have, right? So in that case, we obviously want to buy the cheapest of the two. So we want to compare two items together. That's going to be fairly straightforward, at least a simple version. What we're going to do is implement cheapest, where given two items, we compare the prices and return whichever one is cheapest. Easy. That is going to be a little bit harder, though, because this is really the point. This is what we want to do. We want to implement cheapest F, where everything is wrapped within an F, and somehow we want to implement it. Now, before, we had no tool to work with a random F like that. <clears throat> but now we do. We have functor, we have map. So we could try to see where that takes us. Um, and well, we have two f of items, so we could try to map into them and see what happens. So we first map into the first one, give us an item. Of course, in order to do that, we need f to be a functor. Then we map into the second one, and we have two items, and we know that a um, cheapest is a function that takes two items. So we could call that, and that should solve the problem, shouldn't it? But of course, it doesn't. The problem here is that we are nesting calls to maps, to map. A map is a function that takes whatever and returns something within an F. So if you nest maps, you get nested Fs, which this um, compiler message, it's not terribly clear, um, but it's, what it's really saying is expected an F of item, get an F of F of item, um, fix that because I'm not going to do it. So that doesn't work. We don't have enough tools yet to deal with what it is we want to do. And as before, when we get into that position, what we do is we start drawing. We have as input two f of items, and our desired output is one f of item, and the tools we have are this, the function cheapest. So we want to get that diagram to commute, um, and clearly that's not going to happen, but you clever people, this looks a lot like the diagram we had earlier, right? where I said, well, we're going to invent lift that takes a function with one parameter and lifts it into the F. You could say, well, it takes two parameters, so we're going to call it lift two and, and call it a day. And that is correct. That would actually work. <clears throat> but that would make for a fairly boring presentation, right? Because my next question would be, what about three parameters? Then we could be doing that for a while. Well, not, not, not that long, because this is Scala after all, so for whatever reason, we can't have function take more than 22 parameters, but um, it would still not be very interesting. So we're going to try to be a little more clever. We're going to try to find a generic solution to that problem. And when I try to find generic solutions, I make absolutely everything generic, so we're going to start this... Oh, forgot to click next on the slide, sorry. So this is where we are. Uh, when I try to find generic solutions, I make everything generic. So instead of items, we're going to work with abstract types, A and B. Our desired output is F of C. And the only tool we have to go from one to the other is this function F. And we want to get that diagram to commute, which is not going to happen, is it? Because, well, we have this function F. And really, the only tool that we have is how to lift a function that takes one parameter. This function takes two parameters, kind of stuck. But does anybody know of any way of turning a function that takes two parameters into a function that only takes one? Thank you. Currying. Uh, currying is exactly what I just said. It takes a function that takes two parameters and returns a function that takes one. So we could curry f and have this function. It takes an a, returns a function from b to c. And that function is brilliant because it only takes a single parameter, so we can lift it. And we get that function then, which 
it might not look that interesting as it is, and this is where we need a bit of an intuitive lip, because while that function is not that great, this one would be amazing, because that function looks a lot like the result of carrying something, doesn't it? Function that takes something and returns a function that takes something and returns something else. And of course, currying is a function that has an inverse. If you can curry stuff, you can uncurry them to get our desired solution. So if we could get this arrow here, we'd be sorted. And in order to do that, all we need to do, really, is to link the bottom one to the top one here. Which, what well, we can't do yet, we don't have the tools for that, but we certainly wish we did. So we could just wish for them. We say we want to turn an f of b to c into an f of b to f of c. We could sort of split them apart, right? So let's say somebody give me a split and I'll get that to work. Because when we have the split, then we can compose these arrows to get that, which once we uncurry it, yields the desired solution. And we have a diagram that commutes and we're home free. Uh, of course, there's still a little bit of work to do here because, um, well, Crap part of this diagram, a bit heavy on the arrows, really, but um, quite proud of it. But the, still have a little bit of work to do here, though. We need to be able to um, have a split, right? So we need to do like we did before, really. We need to have a type class called split. Now, the first thing we had to do with that, we've seen, is to lift somehow our function. And in order to be able to lift, we need to be a functor. So lift has got to be a functor. And then we needed to have the split method, which we're just going to, desire, to, to require. Takes an f of a to b, returns an f of a to f of b, and we're done. And with that, we have a concrete split implementation and a solution that actually works. And now, in order to implement that, we can just follow the arrows. We could implement lift2, which is really just following the diagram. First, take f, carry it, and lift it. Then compose it with split. And finally, uncurry the whole thing, and you get your function lift to. Now, you might feel that I have cheated you a little bit here, because I told you, let's find a generic solution that works for any RIT, and I've only implemented lift to here. It's definitely possible to implement lift tree using the same um, mechanism, which you are going to do. But I've really given you all the tools you needed to do that. If you follow exactly the same principle, say that you, have a function, uh, you want to lift a function that takes n parameter, and you know how to lift one that takes n minus one. Well, you know how to turn a function that takes n into a function that takes n minus one, don't you? Something that's not quite currying, but very much like it. So you do that, and then you, can, you get to lift that, and then using split, you're going to be home free. So it's fairly straightforward to do, and I leave that an exercise to the reader. Um, great. So now we know how to lift function of any arity, even truly unreasonable ones, like 21 or even 22, but no more, that would be crazy. Um, we can, now that we have that, we can implement lift to here, we have it, it's now concrete. Our diagram commute, and we can get back to the solution of what it is we were trying, trying to do, which was to implement cheapest. So get rid of all of that code, and follow the arrows. Just that. Again, as before, oh, I'm sorry, and in order for that to work, f must not be a functor, but how do I call it, split. And this is, this is nice, this works. But the code, again, a bit weird, isn't it? Again, transforming a function. What we really want to have is something like that, which makes us a lot more comfortable, because it's a method call. And of course, map2 is just another way of looking at lift2. We can implement one in terms of the other. It's just a call to lift2. And finally, the naming, that's, that's not called a split. Again, that'd be too easy. That's called apply, which is a bit of an unfortunate name, uh, because in Scala, apply is a magic keyword sort of that you really don't want to use in, unless you know, re really know what you want to do, to, you know what you're doing. So it's called apply because traditionally we call it apply, but in Scala we can't, so it's actually called app. But the trade is still called apply, which is a mm, little bit weird. But this is what the, the literature is going to tell you, so those are the names you should get used to. And I believe I'm done here. Yep. What have we learned about apply? What we've learned is about working with multiple values in some f, one or more. We've also learned that its primary operation is app, the new name for split. But mostly, so the, way, the function you're going to use is lift n, or equivalently map n. So most of the time, you can ignore app, just lift n works. 
And at this point, we know how to find affordable items. We know, given multiple items, how to take the cheapest of all of them. Um, what we want to do is, given all the items we want to buy, we put them all in a basket, and we'd like to know the cost of that basket, wouldn't we? That'd be quite interesting before we actually press buy. And the implementation for that is, again, fairly straightforward. We want to implement total cost, which takes a list of, a, of items and returns their price. List is a recursive data type, so we're going to use natural recursion. Um, in a non-empty case, we just sum the head of the price to the price of the tail. And in the empty case, well, the empty basket has a cost of zero. So that's, again, no surprise here. This is something we do pretty much all the time. Uh, sometimes we call it a fold, but still the same thing. And um, now we want to implement total cost F, which is the same thing as before. We just wrap everything inside of F. We get the idea, right? We've done that a bunch of times now, so we can just try to implement it straight away. Um, list of F of item is a recursive data type. Let's use natural recursion, um, which is fairly straightforward. In, in, in the non-empty case, we want to sum the price of the head to the price of the tail, which we can't do, because head is in an F and total cost returns an F, but plus doesn't work within F, right? But it is a binary function, a function that takes two parameters that we want to lift in an F. We've just done that. It's a, it supplies. This is what we just invented. So we can't write that, but what we can write instead is map2, and that's going to compile just fine, except, uh, and of course, F needs to be in apply in order to be allowed to call map2, but then um, we have a problem here. Because what we want to say is the empty basket has a cost of zero, but zero within some f, right? And we don't know how to lift a value in some f. We know how to lift functions in f, but not values. Fair enough, we only lift a value in some f. Um, we don't know how to do that, but we can wish for it. So we can create a, another type class, lift value, whose primary operation is lift value, where given an f, lifts it into, given an a, lifts it into an f. And of course, we needed, um, we needed f to be an apply to even get to that point. So we're going to want uh, lift value to be an apply as well. Now that we've invented that, turn the apply into a lift value, and the code writes itself. And we have the solution to our problem, right? Well, we have a solution, certainly. But I'd argue it's not an actual solution to our problem, because what we were trying to do, if you remember, is reuse code that we already wrote. That was in the title of the, of the, uh, of the talk, right? And we did not reimplement total cost here. Uh, reinvent. Reuse. We did reimplement and reinvent, but we did not reuse it. This is exactly what we're trying not to do. We have reimplemented total cost with something that looks very much like it, but it's not quite it. So we've, we've come up with a very clever solution to a different problem. Now, with software engineers, Usually when that happens, what we do um, is we throw a tantrum, right? And then we go to the customer and complain that they asked the wrong question and try to convince them to ask a different question, hopefully one to which our solution is an actual solution. Now, it sounds like I'm making fun of us, but that's not true. That's, that's, that's a technique, that's a strategy that works quite well. This notion of a solution in search of a problem has proven time and time again to be really successful in our industry. I mean, examples, Golang, um, cryptocurrencies, Elon Musk, tons of things that are widely more successful than they should ever be. But we're together here, we're honest people, we, we, we are going to actually try and find the solution to the problem that we asked. We don't have the tools we need, we get stuck. So again, back to drawing. Our desired input is the list, uh, sorry, our input is the list of every item. Here's our desired output and the tools we have to go from one to the other. It should be pretty familiar by now. And we want that to commute. Now, that should be a reflex. You have a function that takes a single parameter, you lift it. Whatever happens, you just try that and it should probably get you closer to the solution. And, and it does, doesn't it? Because now, there's a, almost a path from the input to the desired output. All we need is to um, sort of link these two, right? We need to go from the left one to the right one. Again, we don't have the tools, but uh, we could wish for them. We could wish to be able to turn a list of f into an f of list, which, you know how, it kind of looks like we're swapping the type constructors, right? So we're going to say, I want a function, not swap, flip. <laughs> I want a function called flip. Um, because if we have flip, then we can compose these two arrows and get a diagram that commutes, and we're home free. 
So that's pretty brilliant. We just need to implement flip. There's just a small twist here. Flip is not going to be a type class because it's not a property of f. It's a property of list, isn't it? So we're going to implement that as a function on list, which we're going to call flip. And flip takes a list of f and returns an f of list. Exactly what I was saying. And the implementation is pretty straightforward, isn't it? Because this is natural recursion. So we are going to do the usual trick of, in the empty case, non-empty case, what we want to do is to take the head and cons it with a flipped tail, which, as before, we can't do because head is in an F. Flip of tail returns something within an F, and cons actually doesn't work within an F. But we know how to fix that because we have invented a pie. So we can um, turn this whole code into a call to map2, for which f needs to be an apply, and then we have the empty case. But we have solved that again already, haven't we? We have invented lift value. So the empty case is just nil within some f. And we're done. That works. So that's flip. Of course, in order for that to work, we don't need an apply, but a lift value. And that's it. And now this diagram is concrete and commutes. And now we can implement the entire thing fairly straightforwardly. This entire code goes, we replace it by first a call to flip, then uh, we compose that with total cost.lift, and in the end we apply that to our input, which gives us our solution. And we're going to make that a lot more comfortable, but not using lift and, and, and map and stuff, but that, which is the same code, only in a way that makes us a lot more comfortable. And it's not called least value. You probably guessed that that was going to be a pattern now. Um, this is actually called an applicative. Um, now there's lots of paper on the matter. I've read them. I don't understand why it's called applicative, but it's, no, it's as good a name as any, really. So, so we call that applicative, and lift value is not called lift value. It's called pure. Not sure why. Um, but this is the name that we have. And what have we learned? Well, we've learned that applicative is about working with any number of values in some f. It's like an apply, but you also end handle the scenario where you have zero value to work with. And its primary operation is pure, but its most useful application is flip. Right, okay, so we are pretty much done with this whole concept of lifting things here. Uh, we're going to get into some slightly weirder territory. Um, and what we're going to be working on now is, I, I don't know if you've been on Amazon lately, uh, but it's a little bit of a nightmare, isn't it, with all the scam and the bad reviews and all this stuff. You, you, it's really, there's a lot of bad product on there that you don't actually want to end up buying. And since I want to automate the entire process, I want some kind of heuristic that is going to filter out the most obvious scam. So what we're going to do, the fiendishly clever heuristic that we're going to use, is for a given item, we're going to look up its seller and then look up the reviews of that seller. And if any of them contains a the keyword scam, then we're going to say, well, that's definitely a scam. I'm not buying that. Um, and the way we're going to implement that, well, the first step is going to be, given an item, I want to find the item seller. And um, well, what's a seller? A seller is the product of the identifier of the seller, its name, and the list of review identifiers. And what we want to write is item seller. Now, item seller takes an item, goes to a seller, and then, well, we wish we could implement it, but it's actually going to prove a little bit more complicated than we thought. Because, what well, we can do the first step, right? We have an item, so we have the seller identifier, so it's a property of items, so we can just do that. But from here, there's really nothing we can do. We really don't know how to go from an identifier to an actual seller. So, let's start drawing. We have an item, uh, we want to go to the seller, and the only tool that we have is this and we want that diagram to commute, for which we need to link this to. Now, we could wish for it. We could say, well, you know, I know the pattern now. I need to link this to, so I'm just going to make that somebody else's problem and, and ask them to link them for me. But the trick of this technique is that you actually have to wish, have to not wish for the impossible. And that is never going to be possible to implement. Because given a seller identifier, you might not always have a matching seller. You, you can't ask people to come up with existing sellers for bad identifiers. You, can, you, can ask, you cannot ask people to make up data, right? So this, this is not possible. The best we can do is ask for that function, where in the case of the seller that does not exist, for example, we would say 
f is option, right? So we have some context that allows us to handle the cases where there's failure, to handle the cases where there's nothing, or all these contexts that we've seen so far. So this is what we can do, and the next step would be to link these two nodes, but for the same reason, that's not going to be possible either, is it? You can't go from an f of seller to a seller. Imagine that f is an option. You can't go from an option of seller to a seller, because by the very definition of what an option is, there might not be a seller to return. So we're never going to be able to link these two. What we can do instead is change the parameters of the program. I told you we would get around to doing that at some point. Um, we can say, well, what we want to do instead is return that. This is now our desired output. And um, with that, we have a diagram that commutes. So we just have to um, propagate these ch changes to our function, and, and, and we sort it. So the first thing we had to, to, to wish for is a load seller function. So we can just add that as a parameter. And of course, since load seller depends on an f, then we need to have an f type parameter. And uh, now that we have that uh, as concrete, well, we're pretty much done. We just uh, also need, of course, we changed the return type. So we need to say that we're not expecting a seller, but an f of seller. Now that we have that, this is the thing commutes. We can just follow the arrows. And um, first thing to do is get the seller ID, which we already done. And then we call load seller on that, which gives us the implementation of item seller. So that was a little bit painful. But now it's going to get worse, because we want to do item seller of f. Um, but the problem, of course, is that there's an infinite amount of item seller of f we could do, right? We would need to write one per version of item seller that we just implemented. What we're going to do instead, because it's not really reasonable to um, expect people to write an infinite number of implementations. Uh, what we're going to do is just take the item seller function, and then we just have the one. And from there, everything else is wrapped. We take the f of item, and we return an f of seller. Everything is written some f, and we want to implement that. Now, we have some tools that we can use for that. So we could, uh, for example, try that. We can map into the, the item seller and, and pass f of item. Uh, but like before, like remember when you were nesting maps, that's going to come up with the, oh, sorry, for that, we need to be a functor. But that's not going to work. Because um, map returns something within an f. Item seller returns something within an f. You're basically nesting maps all over again. So we're going to get an f within an f, which is not something that the compiler is going to feel comfortable about. Um, so we're getting we're kind of stuck. We have to change things. So as usual, we draw things. F of item, this is where we want to get, and this is, the, this is the tool that we have. And we want to get that diagram to commute. Now, probably guessed it. We have a function that takes a single parameter. That function, we're just going to lift it. And once that happens, well, we see that all we need to do is join that top one to that bottom one, and we're sorted. So of course, we don't have the tools to do that. We don't know how to do that yet. But we can certainly wish for set tools. We can say, I want to be able to take an f of f and return an f, sort of flatten it, right? So we're going to ask for a function called flatten. And if we have flatten, then we, get, we can just compose these two arrows to get our solution. And we have a diagram that works. Of course, we have to implement flatten, but as usual, type class, um, we needed to be able to lift, so that type class needs to be a function. And then we need to flatten function, which takes an f of f of a, returns an f of a. And armed with all that, we can get that diagram that commutes and a solution. And we can implement um, item seller. So the old, code, the old code that didn't work goes, and we just follow the arrows. So first, we lift. And then we compose that with flatten, right? And then, in order to be able to call flatten, then we need to have a flatten. And we apply this entire thing to our input to get the desired output. Um, right. Now, this pattern here, lifting and then flattening, is extremely common. It's so common that we're actually going to give it a name because we use it all the time. So since lift followed by flat, we're going to call that lift flat. Um, here's a function, lift flat, which is just lift followed by flat. And if we have that tool, then we actually make our diagram quite a bit easier, because that, all that goes, and we get that instead. We go straight from the input to the desired output, which gives us a diagram that commutes, and we can rework our previous solution to um, look a little bit nicer, because it used lift flat. 
It's a little bit nicer. It's not perfectly nice yet, because it's, again, very functional, isn't it? We are transforming a function. We don't like that. We are OOP developers. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to replace that with something that we should be a lot more comfortable with, flat map. Not sure why it's called that way, but that's the way it works. And flat map is, of course, as usual, as every single step of the way so far, just a different way of calling lift flat. So how do you think flatten is called? in real life? Does anybody have any idea? It is a trick question. Ah, I shouldn't have said it's a trick question, because now nobody's going to raise their hands, are they? OK, so I was expecting somebody to very pompously say, well, that's called a monad. Everybody knows that. It's not. It's a flat map. Uh, it's almost a monad, but not quite. Um, now, I'm apparently running out of time, so I'm going to start accelerating just a little bit. Uh, but we're almost there. Um, so flat map, and of course, um, an interesting, sorry, an interesting thing about flat map, something that you might have realized, is we've used it to turn an f of f into an f. Now, if you remember, when we worked with apply, we had a problem. We had an f of f, and we wanted that to be an f. We couldn't work out how to do that, so we worked around it, and we invented app. But now we know how to go from an f of f into an f, so maybe, maybe we could implement app in terms of that. And of course, of course we can if I'm asking the question. So um, app takes an f of a to f of b. We have an f of a, which obviously we're going to map into, because whenever we have something, we map into it if we can. Then we have a function within an f, so we're going to map into that as well, and apply one to the other. And clearly, that's nested maps, right? So that's going to yield nested f's. So we're just going to flatten the whole thing, and that's going to work. So the interesting bit here is that if you have a, um, a flat map, then you actually also have immediately an apply. Interesting bit about that, this extends keyword, which nobody really thinks about too hard. It's ambiguous, isn't it? In this context, extends means I require a function, a functor. But in this context, I mean I provide an apply. It's exactly the opposite. So we have extends, which means two completely different things, um, depending on the context, which I found quite interesting. Not, not useful, but quite interesting. Um, right, so now. Uh, what have we learned? We've learned flat map is, working, is about working with function that returns values in some f. Its primary operation is flatten, and its most commonly used operation is lift flat, or equivalently, flat map. Now, um, where well, you know where this is headed, right? Um, we're just about to invent Monad, and, and also we are going to try to do the next step into our finishly clever heuristic, seller reviews. Given a seller, get the reviews. Going to do that a little bit fast, it's not that interesting. It's basically what we've done before. So uh, we want a review is composed of its identifier and its body. And we want to be able to write seller reviews, which given a seller returns a list of reviews. We don't really know how to do that, but we certainly know how to do the first step, because it's a property of seller. We get the the, all the identifiers. We don't know how to get any further from here. This should be very familiar, because this is exactly what we did in how to, get a, to go from an item to a seller. So we're going to draw a diagram. We have a seller. We want to get a list of review. All we have is this, and we want to get that to commute. We want to link this to. Now let's take this one step at a time. We want a list of review to a list of, a list of review ID to a list of review. Let's, let's do the small problem first. Let's do review ID to uh, list of review, to, to, to just a review, which we would like to do review ID to review, but we can't because well, there might not be review to uh, map to that identifier. We've just seen that, right? So we're just going to put it in an F and require people to provide us with load review. We have a function that takes a single parameter, so of course we lift it, because that's what we do. Um, now, this one is a little bit different than before, because usually when we lift, we lift into an abstract F and we say, well, you know, just you work it out. But here, we're not working into, uh, lifting into any F. We are working into list. So if we're lifting into a list, then we need to provide an instance of functor for list. So that's something we're going to have to do later. And now we would like to do that. Basically remove the f. Well, that's not going to happen. We've seen that before. I'm not going to, to go through the exact same reasoning. What we can do is the next best thing, is return an f of list of review, which we know how to do, because in order to do that, you just take flip. And of course, for the same reason as before, you can't just remove the f you have to um, change the desired output. So we're again going to change the parameters of a problem. And that gives us a rather quick and maybe a little bit too hasty, but 
solution to uh, the function we wanted. Now, let's turn that into code. The first thing we need to do is to request load review. Load review is here, and for that, we need an F. Then we wanted um, list to be a functor we need to uh, in order to call lift here. In order to do that, well, it's very straightforward because lift conveniently already provides a call to, um, an implementation of map, so we can just um, implement lift in terms of map. Now that we've done that, uh, this diagram is pretty, pretty much finished because everything else is sorted. We just need to change the desired output. We don't want a list of review, but an F of list of review. And um, now, we just follow the diagram. So we've done that. Then we need load review.lift. Sorry, that went a little bit fast, which is equivalent to map. We then compose that with flip. We flip the whole thing. And we got a solution for which we need an applicative. Now, how about seller reviews F? It's going to be a lot simpler than you expect. Um, it looks a lot like before. We take our implementation of seller reviews, we take an F of seller, and we want the F of list of seller, blah, blah, blah. And we don't know how to do that, so we are going to draw a diagram because that's what we do. And that diagram goes from an F of seller to an F of list of review with that tool. And that diagram should look very familiar, shouldn't it? This is the one we had just before. We know exactly how to sort that. Lift that. This is exactly the same problem as before. So the implementation is, in fact, just calling lift flap. Uh, lift flat. It's a bit hard to say. And uh, for which, which you need a flat map. And of course, then we apply that. And we don't like that because it's functionally, and we like OP. So we're just going to turn that into a call to flat map. And now the interesting bit here is that in order to solve the entire problem, we needed um, a flat map and an applicative. Right? Well, there's a name for that. Something that is both a flat map and an applicative is called a monad. A monad is a flat map and an applicative. Um, and that's really all there is to it. That's all there is to say about a monad. Now, should I stop now, or do I have a few more seconds? Three minutes, that's perfect. We can take the questions outside afterwards. Um, right, so I'm going to skip that part in which I ask you to solve that diagram. I'm not going to do it. It's in the slides. You can do it. Um, and in closing, conveniently, right at the right time, um, if you only remember one slide, the one thing to remember is, is that slide, because this is where I point out that I actually delivered on my promise. Um, I told you I'd give you a design technique, a software design technique, that's quite useful, because it really makes your problem, somebody else's problem, wishful thinking driven de development. It's, it is a thing, it really works. So try it out, it gives great results. But more importantly, I've shown you all the abstractions, well, all the useful, the immediately useful ones that I wanted to talk about. Functor, it's about working with a value in one value in some f. Apply is about working with multiple values in some f, one or more. Applicative is about working with any number of values in some f, zero or more. And finally, flat map is about working with functions that return a value in some f, and monad is just an applicative and a flat map. Now, there's, of course, a lot more to be said about this abstraction. My presentation is in no way meant to be exhaustive, but I've given you, I think, I hope, the foundations for you to go out there and learn a little bit more, should you wish it. And, well, we don't actually have time for questions, I think, or maybe a couple of one, and um, the slides are available here and the companion article, so just scan that. Um, and do we have any questions? Uh, all the phones raising. Um, any question? Just dying to go get a drink? Okay. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>